Thank you for downloading this episode of a History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida, and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Kendra Hazen, and I'll be your host for this episode titled Turpentine Industry. Long before Florida became famous for its beaches and theme parks, our state was known for another vital industry, turpentine. The turpentine industry literally helped reshape the southern economy after the Civil War. It became one of Florida's chief exports, had a global imprint, and was an important step in the transformation of the state's workforce and economy. Here, Dr. Nick Wynn, Executive Director Emeritus of the Florida Historical Society, tells us how farmers and agricultural workers cultivated turpentine. Well, turpentining or the turpentine uh, tine industry is one of the earliest industries in Florida and much of the South, and, and what it consisted of was uh, gouging uh, cuts in the uh, bark of pine trees and then allowing the sap or the rosin to drip down where it was collected in a cup and cups could either be made out be terracotta pots or when I was going up the the most likely thing was a tin pan that looked like a bread pan a loaf to cook a loaf of bread that was about probably 10 inches long and four inches wide. Once the sap was collected it had to be put through a chemical process in order to be used. After harvesting the sap would be transported to a still operation. Here, Barbara Hines with the Florida Public Archaeology Network explains the still process. Uh, turpentine is a clear liquid and it comes from the steam from the pine gum that's being cooked. Rosin is like the gook that remains at the bottom of the still after the pine gum has been cooked. And rosin was actually used to caulk um, wooden ships and to coat the ropes and things like that. And that's where the name naval store comes from. Sometimes you'll hear the turpentine industry referred to as the naval store industry. Barbara Hines tells us when the industry developed in Florida and its global impact, as well as the many uses for this natural resource. Um, it didn't really pick up in Florida until the late 1800s. But by the 1850s, rosins and spirits of turpentine and turpentine products were being shipped to almost every country in the world from the southeastern United States. And you find early products that contain turpentine, they range from Vicks VapoRub, <laughs> cleaning products, um, medicine. Uh, it was, I hear a lot of people would use it, you know, on wounds. Um, People used it to clean windows and floors. Of course, now we know that turpentine has detrimental effects on human health, and so there's, and people still use it, but there's safety guidelines for handling it that probably were not in place in the late 18, early 1900s. Although the industry provided jobs to many Floridians, the work was often harsh. Dr. Nick Wynn describes the demanding working conditions of these turpentine camps. It's pretty arduous work, and uh, most of these turpentine uh, camps had riders who would uh, go on horseback through uh, the forest with these guys who were uh, tapping the trees. Uh, and, uh, they fully expected workers to, to not just walk between trees. And keep in mind, you're carrying a, a, a bucket, a five gallon bucket that probably weighed 50 pounds. They wanted you to run between trees. And they, in some camps, uh, carried these bull whips. And if you weren't running, they didn't mind popping you with them and uh, to stimulate it was, it was, um, was not a pleasant environment. Here, Barbara Hines explains that turpentine came to Florida at a time when the nature of work and labor changed throughout the South. 
after the slaves had been freed in post-Civil War, of course, they needed to find another cheap uh, alternative to, for labor. And, of course, convicts became the logical choice. Uh, now, slavery was miserable, but the slaves were actually seen as an investment. So people did tend to take at least somewhat decent care of their slaves. Convicts, on the other hand, they didn't have that protection. If they died of malnutrition, injury, disease, they were replaced at no cost to the person leasing them. And so this was essentially the driving force between the behind the economic growth of the South after emancipation. Well, and most of these convicts were black, um, but some were white, and there were female convict laborers as well. They were treated very poorly. Hines also reminds us that the workers who were not involved with the convict leasing system worked in extremely poor conditions. There were also people that were paid in the um, turpentine industry. Uh, they weren't paid a lot, um, and a lot of times they were paid in company scripts or company money. And essentially what that is, is the company would buy groceries wholesale, and they would have a commissary, and they would sell these groceries at retail price, and you could only pay using company scripts. So when you got paid, you weren't actually getting money like we do today. You were getting probably a little coin that had the company stamp on it, and that's all you could use. So you couldn't use it anywhere else but the company commissary. It became almost you know, a cycle of poverty for these people in some cases. So it wasn't the most economically viable employment, but for a lot of people that were not well educated, this was one of their only options here in the Southeast. The turpentine industry was part of a greater transformation of the southern economy. In the way that northern towns had large-scale manufacturing and factories, southern turpentine companies ran their operations through a factory system. That system not only used a large and pliable workforce, but also looked for innovation and efficiency. One of those innovations was the advent of the Hurdy Cup. Here, Heinz tells us about the Hurdy Cup and its origins. The Hurdy Cup was invented by uh, somebody named Dr. Charles Holmes Hurdy, and he was a scientist. He worked as a chemistry professor at the University of Georgia. He had done a lot of research on the turpentine industry, and he found that it was very wasteful. They were wasting a lot of the gum that was collected from these trees. Before that, they sometimes would use, they would cut boxes into the tree. They would actually take an ax to the, to the tree and cut a hole at the base of it to collect the rosin. And then they would take a, what they called a dipper, which was a tool that they would use to take the rosin out of that box and put it in a bucket. So a lot of it got wasted as they were transferring it from and so he came up with the hurdy cup, which is essentially it's a clay cup that they would put, they would nail it to the tree, and they had metal gutters that were just these little pieces of metal that they would stick to the tree on either side of the hurdy cup to guide the rosin down the tree and into the cup. And this was the hurdy cup was invented in I believe 1902. You'll see different types of them, but the typical hurdy cup is kind of an orange color, and it looks almost like a terracotta flower pot. While the hurdy cup made the process of producing turpentine more efficient, eventually the demand fell and the industry went into decline after World War II. Barbara Hines explains the reasons for the industry's decline. There were other products that were quickly becoming available. Tall oil was one of them, and it's a byproduct of pulping. Um, and by the 1970s, it exceeded distilled rosin uh, in production. It was cheaper. It had more stable prices. There was also the issue of the fact that after World War II, we really didn't make wooden ships anymore. So the rosin industry had a steep decline. You had metal ships. There was no need for rosin. Um, there was a shortage of workers because of the low pay. And by the 1960s, there were only about 3,300 recorded turpentine workers in 
Florida, as compared to 10 years prior, there was about 21,000 workers. So it was a very quick decline. The nature of labor and the economy in Florida changed after the Civil War. We asked Heinz to reflect on the legacy of turpentine in Florida's past. Well, I think it was uh, very important. A lot of our small towns in Florida, in the more rural areas, they were created as turpentine camps, essentially. There are many towns along railroads that probably wouldn't exist if it weren't for the turpentine and lumbering industries. After the Civil War, it was really one of our only industries. There was lumber, there was turpentine, and there was farming and you know, other small industries as well. But this was one of the major ones, and it helped to really keep Florida economically viable. I mean, the majority of countries in the world were receiving turpentine products and rosin products from the southeastern United States. So it was a booming industry at one point. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of a History of Central Florida podcast. For more information about the items featured in this episode, visit the Museum of Geneva History, located at 165 First Street, Geneva, Florida, 32732, and the Museum of Seminole County History, located at 300 Bush Boulevard, Sanford, Florida, 32773. Be sure to join us for our next episode, Gatch Family Farm Equipment.